I would like to thank the organizers for actually organizing this, uh, this uh, uh, workshop. I always attended it and uh, enjoyed the, the wide variety of projects and uh, uh, works that was presented. And now I'm happy to contribute to the variety. And I will talk about, uh, this is actually a collaboration with the experiment uh, biologists. And uh, the work is actually to understand uh, dynamics and the uh, coding in the Manduka sextamoth. So this is how you pronounce it. And uh, so the, you can sit back and relax because this presentation will be more fun. I'll show you movies. And what my, my aim actually in this presentation is to show you, uh, first of all, the experimental part where mathematics is coming into uh, the game and also what are the approaches from applied mathematics that can be applied to this problem. So what you can see here, this is the Manduka Sexta Moth. And um, the Manduka Sexta Moth, except of being uh, an annoying pest and actually uh, bumping into heads of people, it is actually important in the desert uh, by pollinating different flowers. So uh, here you can see that indeed the Manduka sexta moth is pollinating this flower. It likes this flower. This is the Datura flower. And uh, the way that it actually knows how to detect these flowers is by the odor uh, input. So the main sensory input is uh, by odor. And it senses the odors by the, its antennae, not by the nose. So it doesn't have a nose. And it has this tongue that is stuck into the flower, and then it eats from it. And uh, what is nice about it is actually that they are very effective in detecting flowers and actually be feeding from them. So here is a movie showing you uh, the moth in action, how it actually eats from the flower. And another movie is to show you that indeed uh, it relies mainly on the olfactory uh, input. So this is a wind tunnel and the wind blows from right to left. And the wind is the odor that uh, this uh, moth likes. And um, it is actually released in this uh, burst of uh, plumes. And the moth is here in this polygon, and it is released. And what you can see that it flies around a bit, senses the other plume, and then goes to the source of the odor, and actually stays there for a few minutes when the flower is actually is not present there, so it, it's not getting any food. It doesn't see the flower. There is no other input than the other input. So the questions, the research questions that we can ask about this one, it's, it's actually fascinating how this process is happening. So first of all, what determines an odor? So is it this flower or some chemical that it actually uh, senses? And then what is the processing that happens in the uh, brain of, of this animal, and eventually, can we associate a, a mechanism to a, um, the other detection? OK, so let's answer these questions one by one. Let's start from the first one. And uh, here you see, actually, uh, chemicals that or molecules that uh, compose this complex odor, this uh, flower odor. And what you can see, it's actually there is a lot of molecules or chemicals uh, here. And what uh, Jeff Riffel, he is my collaborator, is actually uh, uh, did, what he did is actually taking, excluding some of them and introducing different uh, sub subsets of molecules to the uh, moth and then checking the behavior. And what you can see is actually the result of uh, the experiment. And the results are very interesting because what he observes is actually low dimensionality, that you don't need so many chemicals in order to get the same behavioral response from the moth. What do I mean by that? He actually had the preparation of 10 uh, different uh, odorants or chemicals combined together and compared with actually some mineral oil that doesn't uh, excite any response. And then he started to uh, take out uh, some of the odorants. And what you can uh, see here is that actually, for example, mixture number one uh, was um, actually having the following response, while uh, mixture number 10, uh, where three odorants were excluded from it, 
had a very low response. On the other hand, mixture number four, that includes only three odorants, had uh, this kind of response, which means that actually only few chemicals are important for the moth to uh, capture the odor. And uh, you can see it also by the trajectories. It just ignores this odor and doesn't go to it. OK, so there is a small subset of chemicals that uh, corresponds to an odor like uh, we see here. And uh, now let's uh, go to the second question. OK, so how these others are actually processed in the brain? So the, the structure of uh, the antenna lobe, which corresponds to the brain of the, of, uh, uh, of the moth, is the following. There are olfactory receptor cells. And then these, there are many of them. And they connect to the um, neurons in the antenna lobe. And the neurons here are ordered in the following way. So they are excitatory neurons. They are called projection neurons. And they are inhibitory neurons, which are internal. So they don't have connections to the receptor cells. But what they do, they inhibit the excitatory cells when they become excited. And they are eventually feedback to the brain, and uh, which goes back, that is supposed to, uh, to uh, feed the system or to stabilize the system. At least this is uh, what is assumed. So in experiments, actually, what uh, um, Jeff uh, is able to do is to record from the different neurons and getting actually time series of the different projection neurons. So the only neurons that uh, actually recordings are available are from the excitatory neurons. Okay? And uh, here is a sketch of an experiment. So how it is done, so here you can see a projection neuron. And each time an odor is actually is, uh, introduced, it starts to fire lots of time and then uh, it sets to, to a rest state. And the experiment itself is, is, is the following experiment. So an odor is introduced for a very short time, goes through this transfer line, through this tube to the antenna, and then the moth is actually supposed to respond to it. OK? So previous experiments, and now we come to the question of dynamics. Previous experiments, actually, looking at, uh, at uh, uh, recordings from the excitatory neurons, reveal that if you take averaged trajectories over sequence of trials and trials, what you get is actually these, these very robust trajectories that seem like correspond to fixed points. So in these experiments uh, done by Mazor and Laurent in, uh, in, in Caltech in 2005, what they show is actually a trajectory. So two different orders were introduced. And what you can see is that from this baseline, okay, there is a trajectory that goes and eventually attracted to some fixed point. And then when the order is, it was introduced for a pretty long time, and then it goes back to the baseline. For another order, it actually goes to another region and then is uh, going back to the baseline. So these are actually projections. Uh, I didn't say it. This is, these are projections of the experimental data onto, a, onto some uh, patterns that actually were uh, appearing in the experiments. By doing principal component analysis, they were, were able to uh, detect some patterns and to project onto them. The same situation actually happens in uh, our experiments. And in our experiments, actually, the setup is a bit different because the introduction of the other is for a short time window. So here is the introduction of the other. And you can see the four trials. This is the spike train. Each time that you see a, a line here corresponds to this neuron. Neuron 1 is spiking. Okay? And this is the firing rate. And what you can see is actually that this neuron 1 was active before the order was introduced. And then there is a window of time of almost one second that it is inactive. And then it becomes active again. While neuron 2 has exactly the opposite behavior. But actually what, what can be observed is that there is a firing rate pattern that corresponds to uh, one individual order. And there is another firing rate pattern that corresponds to the different order. So this is the, this is the observation, even, even though the introduction of the order is for a short time. 
So the question is, what is the mechanism that corresponds to uh, this behavior? So let's go to the modeling part. And uh, OK, so there are many unknowns here. So the, uh, the connections between the neurons is, is not well known. So construction of a detailed biophysical model is a, a difficult task. How many neurons on the most cell? So it, it has many in the system. Um, the sensory neurons, they are of order of millions. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, and the uh, processing uh, neurons are on order of thousands. Okay. Okay? So here we have a thousand neurons that we need actually to model. Let's forget about the sensory information for a second. A possibility is actually to introduce a firing grade model. And the, these are, this is the firing grade model in, uh, in uh, implicit form, which is when there is no input into the neurons, they will just decay to the rest state, so just a linear system. And if there is input, they will start to fire. And the main issue is actually to find these coefficients that connect the different neurons. We said there are excitatory connections and inhibitory connections here. But we don't know exactly the ratios between them. OK? So the idea is to use the patterns obtained from experiments to AFE the model and actually to show that there will be always a stable, unique fixed point in the system that will correspond indeed to convergence on this one. And this can be done by taking this experimental pattern, projecting these firing rate equations onto this pattern, okay, and then checking what are what uh, what actually in this two-dimensional system what are the non-clients, and getting that since one uh, non-client is supposed to be monotonically increasing, another one is decreasing, then we will get a unique stable fixed point, okay, and then. Uh, by actually having these patterns and they're being orthogonalized, we can also uh, now project onto these patterns, as uh, in the experiments of Laurent, and um, uh, look at the trajectories both in the experiment and in the theory. So the, these are the projections of the four trials you can see here in uh, different colors and the average trajectory. And uh, what you can see here is actually so the fixed point is placed in this case, A here, and the axis here is, this is A1, the coefficient of the first uh, mode, and this is the coefficient of the second mode. And the fixed point in this case is placed near the boundary here. So you see all the trajectories, although they are noisy, because the sensory input is noisy, they are attracted to the uh, region of the fixed point, crossing the decision boundary of uh, a other one, this is the decision boundary, the shaded region, and then going back, OK? And a uh, similar thing actually happens in the model. So uh, the mechanism in this case is a decision-making mechanism. Each time that there is an input, the system reacts to this input, detects this input, goes to the decision region of this particular input, and then actually uh, evidence is integrated towards a, a specific order. But remember that uh, we actually need, or the system need to be calibrated such that it will support existence of many patterns, of many others uh, altogether. So the, the idea is actually how it is calibrated. We still can uh, choose the weights even here. So we fitted the weights such that they support a fixed point only for one identical order, uh, individual order. Actually, the idea is that the, the weights, so here, here is an introduction some of some of, of the uh, sensory input. And uh, let's say that the sensory input is of a pattern that corresponds to other A, okay, with some noise. So actually, the fitting, if the fitting actually supports these patterns and inhibiting the remainder, then we will actually get coexistence of different patterns by being the fixed point uh, as a, a place near the ratio of uh, these two patterns. What do I mean by that? Is actually that the weights of the inhibition of the interneuron cells are uh, fitted in such a way such that they are orthogonal to the patterns, but actually inhibiting the noise or the unknown patterns to the moth. OK? So in this example here, you can see that other A excites these neurons, 
and then they excite the interneurons, but the interneurons don't actually inhibit the pattern itself, only inhibit the remainder or the noise. And with this, uh, with this idea and actually this modeling, we, can, uh, we went back uh, to the laboratory and actually changed the ratio between the uh, one order to another one. Okay? So now we are changing the mixtures of uh, the others. And what you can see here, these are the projections to the um, coefficients of other A or other B. And indeed, in the case of pure other, we always have crossing on of only one decision boundary. And here in pure other, we have a crossing of the horizontal um, uh, fixed point. What you can see in between is actually that the fixed point rotates indeed, and whether close to this one or to this one, it depends on the ratio. Especially interesting cases here when the fixed point is placed exactly close to both the boundaries, so eventually there is no decision. So you get both sampling of one other and another one. And these diagrams are very useful in, indeed to look at the decision making process here, since this is the difference between A1 and A2, the coefficients of the two other two patterns. In this case, it always goes to the A one of the patterns, and in this case it goes to another one, while in the middle you can see that it actually doesn't cross any decision boundaries. Okay. So these are ratios, and by that actually we can reconstruct. So here is a comparison between a selected uh, neurons in the experiment and actually reconstructed a, a firing rate patterns or uh, rasters of, uh, from the model itself, okay? And uh, they look uh, pretty much alike. So we can, even on the individual neuron basis, uh, we can reconstruct in some sense its activity or its firing rate. Okay, so what can we do with it? So as, as I mentioned, the main mechanism that appears here is the inhibition that makes the fixed point uh, stable not only in the, the projected model but in the full model. So to test that, we can actually block the inhibition and um, there is a drug for that. And this drug is actually the, uh, it's a, a part of antidepressant uh, drug in, in humans as well. So when this drug is applied to the, to the mouth, the mouth cannot uh, uh, inhibit, so the inhibitory connections are not existent. And what you can see here is actually the trajectories are much more noisy and indeed there is no, so this is individual, individual other introduction. We would expect to have trajectories going only to one direction, whether in this case vertical direction or horizontal one, but what we are getting is actually a bunch of noisy trajectories. And it, it also maybe reflects something about humans that we cannot uh, make decisions when inhibition is blocked. Okay, so um, some of the future work. Um, what is interesting is actually now to use this model for uh, learning. And uh, actually, so the, the moth is, as I described, I mainly likes this flower. It's called the Datura uh, flower. It actually has a very nice scent, and this is why maybe it is, it is attracted to it. But what I didn't mention in, in the whole analysis is actually this feedback to the brain and back that can actually change the connections between the inhibitory neurons and the excitatory neurons. And by that, actually, if a new odor is introduced, what is observed in experiments is that a um, MOFs are very quick learners. After five rounds of introduction of an odor and giving them some sugar, so Pavlovian uh, learning, they eventually recognize this odor as if it was an innate odor in, the, in their system. So how it happens? It happens, and uh, one of the uh, assumptions or conjectures is actually it happens due to this feedback that changes the weights between the the others, uh, the, the, the neurons, such that another pattern is added to the library of the patterns. 
And in our case, there will be rearrangement of all the uh, connections such that another orthogonal pattern will be added to the library of the, uh, of the uh, connections between the neurons. And in this way, the moth will actually prefer this flower, which has much, uh, much less uh, uh, nice uh, scent. It actually smells like, uh, like garbage. So <laughs> over the flower that has a much uh, nicer smell. And uh, indeed, these experiments were done. And indeed, what was observed in experiments is that uh, these patterns do change uh, in the firing rate. So you can, you can see then different patterns in, in terms of uh, firing rates. And also, indeed, uh, the moth, you can train it to, to actually almost any uh, flower, a uh, new flower to, to be fed from. And by that, I would like to finish to thank my collaborators. So Jeff Riffel from uh, biology, and Nathan Kutz from applied mathematics, and also the Center for Integrative Neuroscience in the University of Washington that actually combines uh, different researchers uh, from different places to work on uh, interesting problems. And thank you for uh, the attention.